Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. We have a great presentation prepared for you today. We do have a handout available for you in the handouts pod. You can just click on it and open it or save it to your computer. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, you can type them into the questions box and the instructors will get to them as time permits. To earn CPE for attending today, please make sure that you respond to the polling questions. When we launch the poll, it will come up on your screen. Just choose the answer that you feel is appropriate and your response will be recorded. You'll receive your CPE certificate in about two weeks. That's all for me and I'll go ahead and turn it over to our instructors. Thank you. This is uh, this is Mark Cooter. I am uh, a tax partner with Cherry Beckert and head up our real estate and construction practice for the firm. I'd like to welcome you to our update on real estate and construction for real estate and construction companies on the new tax act that recently passed in December of 2017. Uh, we have several speakers for you today. Uh, Ron Wainwright, who heads up our national is the national leader for our credits and accounting methods group. Will be talking to us about various uh, points of the act that will be beneficial to our clients, as well as Mike Desiato, who's a tax partner and heads up our uh, construction practice. Uh, they will be talking on various sectors of uh, the new act and how that may benefit you. A brief introduction on our real estate group. Uh, our real estate and construction group uh, focuses mainly on four areas. Uh, we handle clients within the construction construction industry, the investment side of the house, which is mostly our funds that are investing in real estate, developers and operators, and hospitality. There's, of course, many subsegments of those four categories, but we did want to highlight what areas we, we focus our industries on. What we'll be covering today, business interest limitations applied at the business level. Uh, so Ron will be going through uh, how those interest limitations may apply uh, to your business. Limitations on the use of NOLs and new limits on excess losses from pass-through entities applied at, which are applied at the individual level. We'll talk about increased expensing for tangible personal property, which is the expansion of the bonus depreciation rules in Section 179. We'll also be addressing expansion of simplified accounting methods reduce tax rates for both C corporations and flow through income from real estate and construction companies, as well as that we will address the entity selection process post uh, the new tax bill. And Mike will also be addressing commonly missed tax opportunities for contractors as we wrap up our presentation. What I hope everyone will be listening for and catch during the presentation, we will be talking about timelines on, on when we might expect further guidance from the IRS. We have not received much to date other than the statute from the IRS. Uh, we have any short uh, we'll just with, uh, That will be a interest limitation choice of entity project uh, choice of depreciate capital and then your ability to generate what can you make with the purposes. With that in the presentation on we will get started. This Mark. Uh, I'm leader of the item. Uh, some comments following on marks with to being as we need to attack the job past uh, very fast. Um, so, to sit to uh, July 18 is for a fair and obviously conversions that are impacting real estate, uh, specifically in the J, uh, the uh, offense limitations, 
afternoon talk Dave, who is the IRS commissioner, just on uh, uh, made comments and key where it was made and he expected the proposed regulations for 63J uh, be out. It's, so I'm not sure how he defines that. To the end, we will see the proposed reg the light area with questions. The other area that might be of interest is 199 Cap A, um, or the priority. And the team that uh, is working on the reg project, we're asking with the Secretary uh, this week uh, for a second time uh, to review and uh, acting commissioner uh, indicated in his that he expects to be out uh, in weeks, a month. Um, what I comment to the crack comments is he said the April timetable in front of Congress and seems to be a, a continued uh, slip of will on when the IRS will be getting guidance. Uh, we will do our best. Uh, important area. Uh, you all pay attention, and we're going to advise what kind of guide forward through these. So let's just explain. Um, are aware the Tax Cut Judges Act uh, imposed deduction for business interest for taxable years beginning in 2008. Uh, like other acts of the law, raised many questions for taxpayers, including partners. In the April time. IRS did issue paperwork and a notice in that taxpayers during the regulation indicated um, uh, to see something in, I would say, you know, the latter test in regards to 163. But I think it's, it's a lot of questions answered for pass through entities. As we know, to the Tax Cut Act, the focus of interest expense limitation were on corporations that uh, uh, disqualified interest. Those rules were called earnings stripping that calculated in them uh, with respect to the, the debt. The lowest debt equaled more than half of the equity and net interest exceeded 50% of adjusted income. There, there were some. So, forward to the new law. So, for tax. In 2017, the Jobs Act amended what was on 63C, um, and under the rules that the business interest occurred, was expanded on corporate taxpayers um, on top of obviously there on the corporate side. It's limited, I like here, this interest income, it's a 30% limit. Uh, the taxable income, plus of uh, finance, the uh, carve out, uh, if you will. Only that is now defined ability to deduct business interest expense. Uh, real estate area um, and clients leverage significantly. Uh, this is a very effect of the statute to pay attention to uh, on your debt uh, on your projects. Um, so uh, limited, and we'll kind of go through um, you know, some brief examples. Um, not the the, uh, the interest expense. Um, it's uh, and basically the accrued in the following tax year. You're going to follow through on that. So um, next, in regard 160, um, there are a lot where we know if we have a uh, interest expense limitation under 163J. So a little bit more granularity is basically law says to is purposes of interest expense limitation. We got to key in on the words trade or business and what it does, so to speak does not include is we're going to make the election and basically real property uh, trade or businesses uh, and out that we'll talk about that out if you will is described specifically in 469. Statute uh, for purpose of a real estate professional under the passive loss rules. And there's many 
an irrevocable lecture in a manner that's prescribed by us. Um, so think about the 30 percent uh, rule. Here are the trades or businesses that are impacted that could potentially find their way out of the percent limitation, recognizing you know, the state is, is very debt laden, if you will. Uh, so when we talk about 469C, uh, we're dealing with those trade or businesses uh, as outlined. I think that in the Joint Committee report, uh, it wasn't in the statute, for managing a logic is in fact a real property operation, management, trade or business, which also can apply election um, in regards to um, real estate, trade or businesses. Um, so I think we're at a, a question at this point. Do you see the instance in the 30 percent uh, recognizing uh, real estate is, is heavily debt? If you um, impacting your business. Uh, so we need to move on, and I uh, want to appreciate everybody's uh, on that um, from the standpoint of our polling. And ultimately, the you know the feedback is is that yes, uh, we see the interest expense limitations impacting um, our company. And so far as I can only percent uh, the interest on the the calculation that that we reviewed. Um, so when we think about uh, endpoint. Uh, as to how do we get out of uh, the 30 percent limitation of 163J, uh, I refer to as a penalty for making this one-time uh, election that I mentioned, which is uh, uh, once you make the election, you're bound by the election. Basically, what this is, is that I elect, and I'm a real property trader business, um, I'm going to elect the alternative negotiation system. Um, and I will elect from a perspective of non-residential real property, residential real property, qualified improvement property, which I would draw a question mark around, which I'll highlight. So what is ADS is, is basically it's a, a defined recovery period, which we'll, we'll speak to as to the type of, of uh, non-residential and residential and uh, QI improvement property. It's no longer makers. It's a straight line methodology. Um, so the penalty provision is that I'm giving up the uh, ability to accelerate depreciation, which, as we know in the real estate industry, is very important, specifically as we take into account uh, some of the changes underneath bonus depreciation that I mentioned. So as we look more specifically to the impact of the alternative depreciation system, um, let's kind of dig in a little bit. So when we talk about residential real property and us making this uh, election that is, um, as I've highlighted, we're dealing with depreciation residential buildings and improvements to them other than qualified improvement property, which is a defined uh, section. And what ADS tells us is that it's straight line uh, and the period is increased from the traditional 39 years, uh, which we're most uh, uh, knowledgeable about, uh, to 40 years. So it doesn't extend the the long period of time, but the real impact, of course, is that we're straight lining our depreciation, um, and we're also not, uh, you know, eligible, if you will, from the 168K. When we deal with residential real property, so we're dealing with residents and any improvements to them, that 27 and a half year life that we're all familiar with extends out to 30 years. But again, the biggest impact is in our uh, straight line depreciation, and that we will get out of a 30% a interest expense limitation. Again, just restating the permanent election uh, so that we can have the 19 out 
but once we action uh, in our 2018 return, uh, we have tied ourselves into this ADS uh, methodology in regards to our, our depreciation. And finally, as I said, the, the qualified improvement property is carved out. Um, so it's certain improvements to non-residential real property, um, and it defines ADS in the context of the period is increased from, from 15 to, uh, to 20 years. So as you can see, it's elongating, and then it ultimately uh, is utilizing the straight line to get out of the 30 uh, limit. Our recommendation to you is in the real estate industry specifically, and we're certainly doing this in our business entity analysis modeling that we're doing for our clients, which uh, Mike Desiato will talk about, which we'll refer to as uh, our BEAM. Um, it's very important to understand the implications in 2018 uh, attributable to this election if you, in fact, are going to be. Um, when we think about the questions that are still out there, uh, we're asking for technical corrections. Please say. Um, so 15-year recovery period for qualified property. Uh, that's not the actual statute. Um, the IRS has informally communicated that absent active legislation, which we may or may not see before the end, the IRS will continue to treat qualified improvement property as 39-year property. So we're across the prior slide, 15 to 20, that simply asking for as a technical correction. Um, so the Tax Cuts Jobs Act unfortunately also failed uh, to provide an ADS recovery period uh, for the 15-year qualified improvement property, as I've mentioned. And then ultimately, if a taxpayer makes the election out of the business interest expense deduction, uh, the taxpayer's qualified improvement property appears, and really from our perspective, is ineligible for the bonus depreciation rules that, that um, so when we think uh, about excess business losses, this was another area uh, of limitation. So we, we uh, also have a limitation at the past in regards to what's called excess business losses. Um, so basically there's a limitation now where if I have total business loss deductions, um, those are limited to my business income and gains uh, at a $500,000 level or $250 for single. And I have an example that we'll walk through quickly. Uh, the partner and shareholder level, um, and the limit applies after uh, passive losses or what we know is the 469 of statute. To the extent we have a limitation or an excess, um, then that loss carries forward as an NOL. Uh, under uh, 172 of the statute. So if you look at the right-hand side, uh, just a quick analysis, you'll see uh, example of married filing jointly individual, um, where we get down to the taxable income or loss before limitation of 345,000. So as you pay the excess business loss, important to understand on the right-hand side, we have the $500,000 married filing joint limitation plus the business income and gains in our fact pattern identify Schedule C at 15,000. So our total is allowed 15. Uh, well, we don't have 515, we have 750. So what you see on the right-hand side is the carry forward um, of 235,000, which is the excess loss um, that will be carried forward. So our answer is not for tax purposes the 345, but actually the taxable income loss after the limitation is 110. So it's very important to pay attention to the excess business loss specifically um, for investors of multiple uh, real estate uh, um, investments. So I'll go through um, just to show you some of the uncertainties as to the application of new law on loss carry forwards. Uh, this just tells you where we see we need IRS guidance to make various loss and deduction limitations. So this is simply a highlight of, of what we're still looking for. Um, we started with J, so we're looking for guidance on an entity level limitation. There's a lot of questions that uh, we have posed and other firms have proposed. We will see guidance in that part of August. Uh, there's guidance needed on S Corp basis rules at the investor limitation level, uh, 465, which we know deals with that risk. 
um, and then you can go through the balance. So we're really looking for seven areas of true guidance when we talk about um, loss limitation as well as loss support specifically impact uh, the real estate industry. So uh, we would say stay tuned, uh, and as we see guidance, uh, we will certainly be updating and having another external webinar. So other examples of uncertainty that is existing is that we're looking for clarifying the carry forward rule uh, under 163J as it applies to S corporations, uh, despite uh, what's referred to as the 1371 election. There's a question, how do those two provisions work in hand? No one knows the answer, but uh, stay tuned. Applications uh, around real property traders beyond what the definitions are in 469 that we highlighted earlier for purposes of the disallowed business interest expense and carry forwards under 163J and how, how does it um, underneath those provisions. And then ultimately, there's still questions out there on clarifying the application of a 461. Um, in regards to net operating losses. So as you can see, in the real estate industry, um, there are a lot of questions to encourage uh, this with our uh, clients to go through the business entity analysis modeling where we are um, walking through not only the 469, but the 163J implications as well as 199K, uh, in turn 172 and the limitations at the underlying pass-through level. Uh, so a lot of uncertainty out there, but uh, what we can do is model, we'll look for guidance. Um, so when you think about some of the implications of Jobs Act, think about the building life cycle, and, and we'll go through this quickly as to the implications. So obviously in the beginning, uh, we're either or purchasing, uh, then we go through a phase of tenants in place, uh, whether that's residential or non-residential. Uh, we go through repair and maintenance questions, renew or replace tenants, and then to repairers and sell or demolish. Um, so that's really the life cycle of the building. Now, why is this important? When you think about 2018, there are uh, various rules that we need to make sure we're paying attention to underneath 168 uh, attributable to the purchase um, and or construction uh, of property. Um, so we would encourage due to 168K, which is the bonus depreciation rules. But remember, if you're limited by 163, you're not going to be eligible for those. But we start with, okay, we're either going to purchase or construct a property, and how do we allocate the cost incurred across the various class lives and the various types of properties? How do we go about identifying building structure and systems? Remember, there's animal called tangible property regulations, which became effective January 1 of 14. So, you know, when we see damage to a property, uh, we want to make sure we're taking into account the election of partial disposition. Uh, we want to make sure that we determine casualty gain or losses correctly. Um, and then ultimately, we want to make sure we're applying tests that were defined by the tangible property reg, design building system property to classify whether it was a damage to a roof um, and or a structure. Um, we can also take into account um, any type of renovations, if you want. And when you think about the building cycle where we can expense underneath the tangible property regulations, we have to look at the new rules around 179, what's the effect of maker's depreciation, and then ultimately is this uh, other animal out there being ADR depreciation that we have to take into account as well as we're either uh, renovating or we've had damage to the property or we're bettering the property, uh, or we are uh, actually changing the ultimate use of the property uh, standpoint. So when you think about uh, the Tax Cuts Jobs Act, probably one of the more important aspects, um, that was a significant piece uh, of the, the, the legislation uh, so as to incent and accelerate um, purchase and construction, which is very impactful uh, to the real estate industry, as we know that Bonus depreciation under 168K was 50%. And if I bought new, um, I'm allowed to take a 50% deduction immediately for depreciation purposes if my class life uh, was 20 years or less. Um, so we depreciated that after the 50% immediate expense underneath, again, if under 20 uh, years. 
and then we got a significant generation from a tax perspective. Post-Tax Cut Jobs Act, uh, the definitions changed. This is effective September 27th of 2017. So we're now dealing not just with new property, but we're dealing with used property. Um, so, uh, so to speak, you, you to the taxpayer, I am eligible for a 100% bonus, a depreciation rate, the temporary profession, uh, as it phases down in the 1231-2022 timetable from the 100%. But again, consistently, it's for any property with a recovery period of 20 years or less. So going back to the property side, if I'm building or purchasing a very large structure, that cost segregation study, so as to allocate my purchase price or allocate my construction to get the maximum amount under a class life of 20 years is very impactful to my return on investment uh, with respect to that structure. Um, so, you know, we need to be paying attention to that. So, a key question has arisen as to how is the IRS defining used property? Change, new, pre, post, uh, Tax Cuts Jobs Act, we're in the new world. So basically the definitions that have been uh, put forth, the IRS is the taxpayer did not use the property at any time before acquiring it. Um, now this can get into complications when you have control group rules and things like that, where you have multiple ownership structures. Um, so the other definitions they said is the taxpayer did not acquire the property from a related party or a member of a control group corporation. So yeah, you really have to look at that as to the application of uh, used property uh, as well as you know the definitions from a new perspective. Um, the taxpayer's basis in the property is not figured out, by the way, from the reference of the adjusted basis in the hands of the seller if we're dealing with a uh, you know a purchase. Uh, very important to understand that. The property's basis, in essence, was not stepped up. So the other item I would say the basis is not a carryover basis uh, uh, in the context of like-kind exchanges when we're dealing with used property. So um, though the K is there, uh, you need to really drill out uh, what am I purchasing and what is the real impact specifically on the basis side of things. So the other area that we wanted to highlight was in the simplified accounting method area. So there were four specific provisions, really one that was very specific um, uh, really throughout the recon industry uh, is simplified accounting methods. Now, uh, these are methods where the, whether it was a $5 million threshold dollar threshold consistently went to 25 million um, on average gross receipts and so um, we may know that under you know uh, the prior law we dealt with uh, accrual basis of taxpayers uh, where I had to, to move to accrual once I breached the 10 million dollar level so if I'm under 25 million I can be on the cash basis method of uh, accounting uh, as long as my average gross receipts are less than 25 million further they uh, not necessarily applicable to recon, but they simplified the inventory rules, so simplified what was referred to as 263 Cap A. But most importantly are the two provisions of cash method and then ultimately the completed method of long-term contract, uh, where we know the old rules would force you to a percentage of completion methods. Now, if I'm under 25 million um, and I have a long-term contract, I can basically change my account, very similar to changing my a method from accrual to cash, 525 method, automatic changes by the way, but obviously a significant impact if I can no longer be forced on percentage of completion to recognize my revenue, but I get a completed contract method um, if I have a long-term contract. Uh, so very important attention to from that standpoint. And that brings us to our second polling question, which is will your company take advantage of the simplified me accounting methods? Um, specifically, um, probably the accrual to cash and certainly the, uh, the movement off percentage of completion to, to long-term contract uh, if I'm under that $25 million more.
I think the general coming back from us is uh, yes, uh, which is a good answer in regards to the polling question, um, that the companies uh, saw the provisions in the Tax Cut Jobs Act as simplifying, and specifically on the accrual to cash, and specifically on the long-term contract for getting off percentage completion, important. Uh, so I now want to turn it over to uh, our other presenter, Mike Desiato, who's a tax partner down in our South Florida practice, who spends a significant amount of his time in the real estate construction industry. Uh, so Mike, I'm handing it off to you. Thank you, Ron, and, and welcome, everyone, and, and thanks for joining our, our presentation this morning. Um, my name is Mike Desiato, and as Ron said, I'm here in the four Louis, and I do lead the firm's uh, construction tax practice. And what I plan on doing for the rest of the uh, seminar is to talk a little bit about how the new tax rates are going to affect the choice of entity decision going forward in the post-TCJA world. And with the remaining time, I'll cover what I think are commonly missed construction industry uh, tax strategies. So before getting into the details, uh, I can tell you that the game have definitely changed around entity selection, not only for new ventures, but also for existing businesses. And, and consequently, you know, the old paradigm that we, we used to use to, uh, to make this entity selection uh, decision has definitely uh, changed and has to be reexamined. So let's get uh, let's get into uh, um, what has happened to tax rates. Well, you know you probably already know that the corporate rate change uh, was was very dramatic. You know it, it, the rate change is about a 40% reduction in the overall rate from a maximum rate of 35% to now we're at a 21% flat rate on all on all corporate. And if that weren't enough, um, corporations are also no longer subject to the alternative minimum. Uh, as far as uh, pass-through entities, S-Corps, LLCs, uh, single-member LLCs, uh, the rate reduction wasn't that steep, but with the new 20% Section 199 Cap A deduction, the old maximum rate on pass-through, which was as high as 39.6%, is now maxed out at 29.6%. So the rate reduction for pass-through income is kind of a it works out to be about a 25% reduction. Again, not as steep as the 40% reduction for C corporations, but still a nice reduction. And as you know, and as a bit, uh, just as a very high level review of this area, you know, qualified business income is any income from um, an S corporation partnership or a sole proprietorship. It does not include reasonable compensation for a shareholder or a guaranteed payment paid to a partner. And more, more significantly, it does include income from what is what is termed specified service trades or businesses. And those trades or businesses, as listed on the slide, are essentially the, the, the professions of law, accounting, health, health, financial services. Great services are, are uh, in there, and athletics, performing arts. And this is a very tricky one. Any trade or business with a principal skill or a principal asset is a reputation of skill, one of owner or employees. Now, the engineers and the architects had a very effective lobby, and they, they have excluded them from the specified server trader business um, act, uh, group, so they're not included. So what's not, well, you know, anyone who's in the real estate rental business, anyone who's a developer, any contractor, and any architect or engineer is, is not going to be precluded from taking deduction as a specified server trader business. But you know there are some unanswered questions, and 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 uh, we're waiting for some guidance on that. And as Ron alluded to, hopefully we'll get that very soon. But one of the areas that has come up specifically in a real estate context meant by the term brokerage. And you know there are, there could be a lot of commercial estate brokers out there who are in their heads. Consider if you know I'm a specified trader business and I'm not able to take 20% deduction. That that issue is still up in the air, and hopefully we'll get some guidance soon on that. And then, um, you know, going back in itself, you know, if you're in a specified service trade or business, um, that doesn't mean you're out. That means you, you, you still have a deduction so long as the taxable income of the owners is less than $315,000 if they're married filing jointly or $157,500 if they're in another status, uh, they still can get the deduction. Uh, if their income goes over the uh, 315 level or 157.5, the deduction starts getting phased out for the dollars of income if you're married, filing joint, or 50,000 if you're in the other category. 
And for other businesses that are not specified service trades or businesses, there's still, there is a limit uh, for those where, where their income is over 315 uh, for married and 155 and a half for other. And that limit is essentially greater of their share of, uh, or 50% of their share of W-2 wages from the entity or uh, the sum of 25% of the wages from the entity plus two and a half percent of the unadjusted basis of all qualified property. And let's just look at that a little bit and uh, let's just down a little bit. The, the basis really it refers to and it is usually the original cost basis of the property. So this latter, latter limit, percent, two and a half percent limit, is really very uh, beneficial to those who have who, who are in the real estate space because you know uh, if you have a rental building or a rental operation that two and a half percent of the original cost basis property is going to give you it could give you a pretty high limit on this on this 20 percent deduction. Some of the issues that that are still some of the issues that need further class clarification and and really a caveat here as well is that you know as currently written uh, you can have two identical businesses where you would get uh, totally different treatment under under section 199 cap a uh, so for example if you had a one person s corporation and you had a person or single member llc uh, you can get an interim result for what is essentially the same business and what I mean by that is the single member S corporation, the sole shareholder S corporation, uh, are going to be wages paid to the shareholder, and those wages will help in terms of giving them uh, a cap on the on the percent of W-2 wage cap will, will be something they'll be able to utilize to get the 20% deduction. But if you're a single member LLC uh, owner, uh, there's no wages paid to you, and unfortunately, your self income uh, from that entity is not counted like wages for purposes of percent deduction so you, you, there's there, there's so, there's some there's some issues here around uh, you know uh, treatment and fairness of, of the law and hopefully forthcoming rules will kind of clarify that the other thing I, I and I've, I've read about this and I'm sure you all have read financial uh, is, is that there's a lot of talk about stripping out of an existing entity that is a non that is a specified service trade or business uh, some of their activities that are not service trades or businesses and the classic example would be the dermatologist whose practice is in the field of health therefore it's a specified service trader business and they and assuming their income is over the three hundred fifteen thousand dollar four hundred fifteen thousand dollar levels they would not get a twenty percent deduction but they stripped out of that business their product sales operation uh, and put that in a separate company uh, then perhaps that that business would qualify because it's not one of the special trades or businesses and you know there's a lot of articles about that kind of planning but I, I would caution everyone uh, not to do that yet and and to wait until we get guidance because you may be doing something be prohibited not work and then you're going to have to try to unwind it so that could be very costly so you know I I kind of uh, in light in light of these uh, again the, there's a lot of articles out there in the financial press about the reemergence of the C corporation and so I kind of asked my colleagues and my clients, you know, how many are you are considering setting up your new entities as C corporations, or how many of you who have existing companies are thinking about converting to a C corporation? But that's not a polling question. This is a, these are rhetorical questions. So um, it brings up the issue now of why is there why is there all this noise around C corporations? Well. The reason why it's becoming a, a topic of, of interest is because when you combine the dramatic reduction in the C corporation tax rate with the fact that the tax rate on capital gains associated with an asset sale are now almost equivalent as between a C corporation and a pass through. And now, you know, the C corporation rate dropping to 21%, and for a pass through owner, if they sell their assets in their business and they're active, that tax rate is 20%. So that, that rate on the, on the capital gain on the exit is pretty equivalent, uh, barring and excluding the state income taxes here. And, and when you combine those rate reductions uh, with uh, an old, uh, that's been in the Internal Revenue Code for quite some time, that being Section 1202, uh, in the right circumstances, and I will show you how, uh, C corporations may be the entity of choice. So what is this Section 1202? Uh, 
again, as I said, it's been around. It hasn't been used, and I'll get into why it hasn't been used, uh, and now it's why it's becoming more more popular. But 1202 essentially gives the owner of a C corporation a 100% exclusion on the gain attributable to their stock if they purchased it after uh, 927-2010, both for regular tax and AMT purposes. Uh, the exclusion has a cap, uh, but the cap is quite uh, robust. It's it's $10 million, it's the greater of $10 million, or 10 times the shareholder's tax basis in those shares. Now, you know, there's some requirements around 1202. It isn't as simple as that. Uh, there are four main requirements to get that treatment. The first requirement is that the stock has to be acquired at original issuance in exchange for money or property or as compensation for services performed to the company. And the company must be qualified. It must be a qualified small business at the time of issuance. There's an active business requirement. And uh, this one, too, is, is very important. You have to hold the shares for at least five years. So let's get into some. Uh, what, what is a qualified small business? Um, you know, the average, uh, that, that basically says that the average gross receipts or the gross assets do not exceed $50 million both before and after the issuance of the The active business requirement requires that at least 80% of the assets are used in the active conduct of one or more qualified trades or businesses. And the little caveat there is you got to be careful because if you start investing too much in in non-qualified assets such as stock or securities, in non-subsidiary companies or real property that's not used in your trade or business, you may fail the test. And we'll see in a minute how using 1202 can eliminate or substantially reduce tax on the accumulated C corporation earnings, including gain on the sale of assets upon liquidation. Let's talk a little bit about the active business requirement. What kind of businesses qualify? Well, you know, most distribution, manufacturing, construction businesses will qualify as a qualified uh, business for 1202 purposes. What a longer list of what doesn't qualify is, and you know, specific for this audience, it's particular. It's also good to note that leasing or similar businesses uh, do not qualify. So those of you in say commercial leasing business or rental operations, uh, unfortunately, you're gonna you're not gonna be able to qualify for 1202 nor our brokerage services. So let's go to the next one. I'll show you, um, give you a reason why, and I know this is a very busy slide. Why wasn't 1202 used in the past? Why is it all of a sudden becoming popular? Why, why do we need it and why wasn't it used before? Well, I'm starting with the premise here that most business sales uh, were structured and will be structured for the most part as asset sales and not stock purchases. And with that said, if you if you start in the left hand column, you'll see if you don't if you didn't have 1202 in effect pre TCJA, you work your way to the bottom line that the you know, at the the, the pass through entity would net the most after amount to the shareholders, uh, 220 to 156. 1202. Now you could have used 1202 in the old days, but even if you did use 1202, the pass through entity was super and, and again, this is why you didn't see much of it uh, used in the past. But now, if you go to the further columns, you'll see in the post TCG where the rates for C corporations have dropped dramatically to 21%. Uh, you could see now that it's, it's shifted. And now, in the right circumstances where income is accumulated and not distributed out, for the most part, you'll see that the C corporation. Will, will net more after-tax money to the, to the shareholder. I'm on a polling question here, and the question is, uh, have you considered your company's current tax entity selection and how your tax rates may change?
Okay, um, let's move on. Um, so, you know, if you, um, moving slide. Yeah, here we go, sorry. Um, so in, in, a, in a nutshell, if, if the plan is to retain a significant amount of income over years, the, the nine point or almost 10 point differential in the operating income tax rate uh, may, wipe, may wipe out or exceed the one point differential on the ultimate sale of the business. And again, I'm excluding state taxes for this purpose. So, uh, we at Sherry Beckard have developed uh, a tool called the BEAM tool, and BEAM is an acronym for Entity Analysis Model. And what I've done with that model uh, is I've taken a hypothetical, and you can see that on the next slide, taken a hypothetical of a company, a construction business that generates a million dollars of annual net income, and the owner takes out a half million dollars of salary, and there's no limitation on the deductibility of interest, and, and it qualifies for the 20% 199 cap A deduction, and the business is going to accumulate after-tax income uh, for its reasonable business needs and make payments. It'll earn 8% on that money, and you sell the business, and there'll be a $3 million gain on the sale of the assets, and then and the owner's basis in the shares is $3 million. If you go to the next slide, you'll see an excerpt from our BEAM uh, tool, and you'll see clearly, well, not so clear, you have to know where to look. If you look at the uh, asset sale with 1202 uh, column, in the C Corporation column, the second row, you'll see that in that scenario, with 1202, the net amount to the owner is gonna be $13.6 million. If you compare that above, to a C corporation with no 1202 treatment or through entity treatment, you'll see that um, the, the asset sale of, and liquidation with 1202 gives the owner uh, almost a $2 million over being a pass. So this is something where, again, a, a perfect situation, uh, if, the, if the income is gonna be accumulated and reinvested in the business, it's a great, it's a great opportunity uh, to use inspiration. So what I've been telling clients and what we've been telling our partners is, you know, we got to start evaluating uh, C corporations and entity structures again, our beam tool. Um, and, you know, what's, what, what's going to work and what's not going to work. For instance, uh, I have clients calling me saying, well, I'm an S corporation. Can I revoke my S and I'll become a C corp? Will that get me there? And the answer is no, because remember, there, you, the stock has to be at a, uh, be the original. Age. So revoking an S it's not going to get you into uh, the C Corporation 1202 world. But if you're an LLC, you can convert to a C Corporation, and that will work. Uh, but 1202 treatment will only apply to any post-transition tra appreciation. And again, we can model that with our BEAM tool for you. Uh, also, if you're an S Corporation and you want 1202 treatment uh, and, you, and, uh, and the revocation, and you could... I think you can still get there by restructuring your but again, the 1202 treatment will only apply to post-transition appreciation. And finally, if you don't want to go through this restructuring, uh, and you're an S corporation or an LLC, uh, you, can, you can form a new C corporation uh, for a new business line and get you there. So uh, in the next few slides, um, I, I show kind of the advantages and disadvantages of the S corporation or the LLC versus the C corporation. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to be uh, covering each one of these things, but I recommend that, you know, you take all these things into consideration in the entity selection process. So let's move to our fourth polling question, and that is, when do you think the IRS guidance under the TCJA? Will it be in August of this year, September of this year, uh, 2000, or you're not sure? Okay, let's uh, let's move forward here. With my remaining time, uh, I want to touch on some of the most commonly missed 
uh, construction strategies uh, that I, I see uh, most often. And, um, you know, they can be basically lumped into uh, five buckets. Um, contracts are not subject to percentage of completion. Uh, contract method changes need to be filed on time. Uh, cost allocation for contracts uh, are subject to um, cost allocation for contracts are subject to the POC uh, requires a change in estimated costs. Um, the AMT preference item only applies to certain long-term contracts, and I think there's a failure sometimes to utilize all uh, available credits. So. Um, Moving to the next slide. Okay, so, um, the first one, the, the first commonly missed um, strategy that I see is um, that exempt contracts are not to the percentage of completion. And um, I'm not sure if the slide is showing yet. Um, so, uh, okay, so the, the most commonly missed one, the first one is that exempt contracts are not subject to percentage of completion. And, you know, taxes and gross profit uh, on the financial statement should not equal, in most cases, the tax revenue and gross profit on the, uh, on the financial, on the tax return, excuse me. So one of the things I see is that home construction contracts should not and are not subject to Section 460, the Internal Revenue Code. And home construction contracts, where the 80% or more of the work is for the construction of four or fewer uh, dwelling units in a building and the, the related improvements to that. Uh, for example, townhouses and individuals are home construction contracts. Those are not subject to percentage of completion. You don't need to use that. The other, the other opportunity is residential construction contracts are also eligible to use something called, um, yeah, yeah, I need the next slide here. Um, the other thing I see is residential contracts are um, are not subject to percentage of completion. They're subject to, they can be uh, accounted for under something called the uh, completion capitalized cost, which is a special method. And typically those kinds of contracts, contracts for the building of condos, apartments, and um, here you go. Sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, home construction and are exempt from 460, you don't need to use percentage of completion. Uh, residential contracts, which are typically contracts for the building of condos, apartment buildings, and even prisons, are eligible for this uh, percentage of completion capitalized cost method, which allows you to use uh, a method where 70% of the income is accounted under percentage of completion principles, and the other 30% uh, for under your non-exempt method uh, of contracts uh, your exempt method, excuse me, which could be completed contract, cash, or accrual. Um, uh, another uh, opportunity here is there is a provision where you don't need to report revenue for contracts that are less than 10% complete. And that's something you can easily do by just doing it on your tax return. The next one I see um, is, or not necessarily say, but next thing I think you need to be aware of, and it's often missed, is that if you wish to change your method of accounting for contract revenues, you need to do it uh, in the year of the uh, change. So if you want to change it for 2018, you need to do it in the year 2018. Uh, and of course, uh, not of course, but you got to realize that those method change uh, method changes are done on a cutoff basis. So you don't have to change what you've been doing for old contracts, but any new contracts entered into the year of change uh, will be accounted for under the new method. The old contracts will be completed, uh, accounted for. Under the new and uh, and there's no 481 adjustment. Um, if you have, if you want to change from cash and accrual to, uh, or change to cash and accrual methods, those are automatic and they're allowed up to the extended due date of your return. 
and any 481A adjustments for those changes are allowed in the first year. And unfortunately, the IRS does charge for this. Um, in addition to our fees, uh, you have to uh, pay the government $9,500 for any of these accounting method changes that are not automatic. Um, the next one I, I see, and it's a, it's a great opportunity, is the, uh, is the cost allocation uh, for those contracts subject to percentage of completion. You know, uh, for, for, for gap purposes, uh, pretty much it's, uh, for costing purposes, they use pretty much direct costs and some indirect costs. But under the tax rules, much like we do under 263 Cap A, you know, you also need to capitalize and, and, and attribute to these contracts all direct and indirect costs. And, and those costs often include officers' compensation, employee benefits, pension costs, repairs, rents, insurances. All the indirect costs need to be included in the estimated cost to complete. And uh, when you do that, and the, the bottom line here is that you're going to get better tax deferral of income if you if you do things this way if you do it this way um finally not finally but before we get to the last one i, I see this happening a lot with amt as you know the difference between percentage of completion and um uh, and and the tax method of accounting for contracts is a preference item for amt purposes which going forward would only apply to pass through entities but we keep in mind that Home construction contracts don't give rise to a tax difference or a preference difference. Uh, the 10% election deferral is not a tax difference. Uh, the difference in cost allocation that I just pointed out is not one. And all your depreciation uh, for bonuses and 179 uh, elections, those are not um, a tax preference item. And finally, for the last, uh, for this year, the, the DPAD deduction is not a tax preference item. But I see them thrown in there a lot, but be aware that they're not included. And, and finally, um, the last thing I would mention here is, uh, and it's a mistake, I believe, is that there are a lot of credits uh, that are not utilized in this, in this area. Uh, most particularly, the work opportunity credit is missed a lot, and the research and development credit is missed quite often, too, for, for those uh, contractors who are in the design-build field. So those are my commonly missed tax strategies for contractors. And I think, uh, is there one more um, polling question? Or I think that may be the end of the presentation. But, um, but. Thank, yes, yeah, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. This is Mark again. We appreciate everybody's attendance. Hopefully uh, you were able to gain something from the conference. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to any of the presenters. And we'll be happy to get back to you um, with any of our uh, thoughts. Once again, thank you for your time and look forward to, to speaking soon. Thanks.